to rush quite as much. Next slide. Um, right. So this is a, I should preempt by saying this is a, a basically a user space API that we're talking about exclusively because per CPU stuff in the kernel is really easy. Um, you know, you, there are all sorts of macros and, and uh, cases to deal with and unless you have to worry about being migrated, which is pretty easy to avoid, um, you can just do it. And in particular, you can modify per CPU data without using any atomic constructions. Um, we'd like to be able to do that in user space. We'd like to be able to take a lot of the, st of the stats we, we collect, a lot of the resources we cache, things like that, down from a per thread level to a per CPU level. In particular, Paul's other topic about how we're trying to build these systems where we have many, many user threads is the reason why. Um, per thread crashing works great when you have a thread per core model. Uh, when you have a malloc cache on every thread of 5,000, all of which are, act, are highly active malloc this falls over really fast. We, we, um, I, I, I was dealing with some of the people who run web search, and they told me that at one point, the, uh, every single thread in, the, in, their, in their system was on the same lock trying to find malloc. Um, it's a non-starter, basically that's worth pointing out is a lot of the times in these systems when you have different threads acting on the same objects, you'll have one thread allocating the object, setting up the request, passing it on to another thread which then works on the request. And what does it do when it's finished the request? Well, it deletes the object, which means you have this one thread allocating objects and the other thread freeing all the objects. And so now you have to handle this. Your cache isn't actually caching anything because one thread's doing all the allocations and that thread's doing all the frees. Um, by moving these to be per CPU, you kind of naturally get that plumbed through without having to do these transfer cache-like operations. So we'd like to be able to do these per CPU operations from user space without having to worry about being preempted, without having to worry about being migrated, without having to worry about anything, any of these things happening. Next slide. Right. And the key way we manage this is that we limit what you can commit. And by commit, we mean uh, modify data in a way that's observable to other threads or other C or any, anyone that's not you. And it turns out that many operations that are useful um, only modify one word once. Um, and so we have this three-phase setup. We do preparation, we issue a single write, and then we, uh, and we also have a restart block if anything goes wrong in, in that process. And what we set up is that from what the user space can observe, um, the prepare block and the write instruction execute entirely without being migrated or preempted or anything else happening, as far as they can tell. And we use the restart block to do this. But for all intents and purposes, you, you, we, it's like we can turn off preemption in user space. You, you basically get a per CPU software transaction. Yeah, it, it, software transactions are a good way to think about it, except with very, very limited write set, and the write has to be at the end. Uh, next slide. Right. So yeah, the prepare block is pretty simple. All it is is just whatever you need to do to figure out where you're going. Um, and the trick is that the kernel extensions we've implemented will just tell you to do this again and again and again until you make it all the way through without having been preempted. The key difference between the prepare block and the write block is the prepare block is the work you can do over and over to set up the write block, right? The prepare block is, I think I'm going to commit on this CPU, so set up my, like if I'm in queuing onto a list, say the next is currently this CPU's list head, and I'm going to set it up as if I'm going to push there. And if we get reinterrupted, we can always redo the preparation. The write block is, we call it a block, but it's really a single instruction. It says, okay, as long as I execute serially with the prepare block, the prepare block is entirely valid and can be committed. Um, but the important point is that once you've started working through the right, you, you can't go back. There's, you, you, you've done irreparable damage or you know, hopefully irreparable progress. What are you doing? Ah, oh. Thank you. Next slide. Right. So yeah, the right, like we said, the right, uh, the right block is just a single instruction, and we, and we, and it runs without interruption, as far as the user space can tell. So next slide. 
right. So the restart is because we can't actually turn off preemption, we can't actually turn off migration. So what we end up doing is we end up noticing. Or sorry, just... Yeah. It's oh yeah. Um, what we end up doing is uh, if we observe these things happening from the kernel, then the kernel knows to move the instruction pointer to a designated restart section. That, and the restart section, very basically, in most cases, all it has to do is just tell you to go back to the beginning. Um, yeah, so, and then the key observation here is this, you know, this doesn't actually necessarily happen immediately, is the other thing to remember, because you know, we've been preempted, we may stop running for milliseconds or you know, who knows how long, but it, this just says that when this thread resumes control, it should be at the restart point, not where it was in the prepare block before. The nice thing about this is you can think about it as like a long jump that implicitly occurs when the thread's rescheduled, so that we don't actually place any restrictions on the kernel scheduling the thread. Because when you look at how we do it in the kernel, right, what we do is we do get CPU, which says, okay, I'm going to do some post CPU operation, and I'm going to block preemption, and I'm going to block migration. And, you know, you cannot expose an API like that in user space. And even in the kernel case, the RT guys have been, well, this get CPU is actually a problem for them because those periods are unbounded and not something you, you can interfere with. Um, so what we, by doing it this way, we give software, we don't place any restrictions on what the kernel does with the user thread. The kernel is free to preempt and migrate that thread at any time. If it happens to occur in one of these soft transactions, that transaction gets restarted, it'll, it'll occur whenever, it, it, it'll proceed wherever it goes. And the, the nice, one of the nice things is, one of the first things you'll do in your prepare block, if you're doing a, when you're doing a post CPU operation, is you'll load the CPU you're trying to proceed on. So if you're doing something like a post CPU spin lock, and the kernel interrupts you while you're trying to acquire it, and you migrate, you'll automatically start trying to acquire it on your new CPU and not your old CPU, right? You get this nice guarantee that you will never ever touch, a, you will never pull these cache lines from remote CPU. Um, you get a hard guarantee of that because user space can never be running in a place where it can do it unless your uh, PWR block is miscoded. Sorry, was there a question? Um, sorry, you probably shouldn't. The whole point of this is to have a, a, like, a per CPU transaction that as soon as you move out of your CPU, you're not, you basically roll it off and do, do something again. Um, which sounds like a reasonable approach to do this. Um, I'm just wondering, you, you restart block, I mean, how do you, how do you actually schedule your, all your, how do you abort a transaction essentially? Like, how do you, how do you know that the you... The kernel, we, we've, we've added kernel handling directly. Um, in, in, or in, do you actually, okay, do you, do you actually use transactions? No, there's no, there's no, like, there's no transactional support. There's not, there's not actual hardware transactions or anything like that. Um, the kernel just, you, you register an area of your binary with the kernel. You'll see some examples later. But that, and then the kernel just knows, if I preempt you during your execution of this, please restart me. And restart means that you go into this other block in your... It's right, it's a long jump. Yeah, okay, well, so we, now, this should become quite clear once we see some of the code on, on, on screen, I think. All right. Sorry, all right. uh, don't mean to interrupt, but... Uh, Mike. If you're doing a linked list push, you just need to figure out the current CPU, find the head for the current CPU, set your next to be that head, right? Assuming you're doing a stack as a linked list. Then the commit is say, okay, the head of the CPU is now my updated element, right? Which we know, knew pointed to the current next in the CPU, and if it ever, that had changed, would have been restarted. And the restart is just <laughs> try again, right? Pick the current CPU, pick the next. And so when we say the logic is in user space still, what, what this means is the kernel has knowledge of what this region is. And if it schedules you in this region, it transfers your IP to a place in the region where you can figure out how to um, fix things up. So basically you have an ABI with user space where the kernel says, you know, if you're preempted within this region, your RIP will move and inside one of the, inside a par architecture RIP, we will, sorry, in par, par architecture register, we will put the RIP where you were restarted so that you can figure out in user space how to unwind it. The next so the next here. slide has this explicitly. Um, so yeah, here we have it in, in x86 assembly. And 
the trick is that all these things marked region, like those are all prepare blocks. And um, in fact, at, for all the different primitives we provide in user space, all of the prepare blocks are just physically contiguous in the binary. And anywhere in there, the kernel will take you to one restart handler if you get preempted during there. And then the kernel, and then sorry, the user space restart handler knows what all those different regions mean. And so you can see here that this is a, a, is a spin lock. And so from zero to two is where the prepare and write, write are. And so if you get interrupted in there, you, you t we tell you to restart from zero. Whereas if you're in, on that ret instruction after the region two, then you already did the write. You've gotten the lock. And so we tell you to restart there because you already finished. We don't want to, we don't want to start again. Um, right. This also examines the one other feature that is important to make this functional in user space, which is that inside that fetch local data macro, there is a TLS reference. And that TLS reference points to uh, a word that the user space also registers with the kernel, which the kernel guarantees to contain your current CPU ID. Uh, CPU ID. Because the other half of this is that to access local CPU data, you have to know what your local CPU is inside these prepare blocks. But between those two features, between the restart and the guaranteed always up-to-date CPU ID, uh, which is, by the way, also really useful elsewhere, because it turns out that's a valuable thing to have, and TLS read is a lot cheaper than SCAD get CPU. But that's neither here nor there. Uh -huh. um, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, and those handle region prefix macros are basically just macros that expand to... Um, it's a jump table. The, the kernel, when it restarts you, it'll move you to a... When you, you register three IPs, you register the start of the region, the end of the region, and the, and the address of the restart handler. And there's a calling convention into the restart handler that when, if you're preempted or take a signal within the region defined by the start and end, the kernel will update your rec to be the restart handler, and it will contain, it'll put inside a particular register. In the x86 case, I think we use R12. R10. Um, R10, I'm not sure. We use, we use one of the um, club of registers to say, this is the address that you were restarted at. And from that, you can, re you can figure out where in the sequence you are and correctly either say, you know, if you, were re if you were interrupted after doing the MOV, right, this is the reason these are separate regions here is once that MOV is issued, the lock's held. You just happen to be interrupted at a really unlucky time. So all that's saying is, well, we actually completed the transaction, right? So it, it's not obvious at first, but the PWR blocks are actually all inside this one region you register with the kernel. And you identify the sp specific commit instructions so that you can figure out if that commit instruction has executed for that sequence. So what, what is uh, So you end up with a d uh, data structure you have to search. And uh, if you find yourself exactly on a commit, then you know you should leave it alone. Uh, if, you if, you, if you're about to, well, if the IP is the commit, that, right. that, then you haven't done it yet. Well, so okay, you go so back. In terms of this thing. Uh, you'd have uh, region two would be an address in some big table. Um, and also the, the RAS uh, spin raw. <laughs> <laughs> the region two. Yeah, right, expands to them. That, yeah. that just so, so, from zero, so from zero to two, if you show up in the region from zero to two, you need to restart yes. uh, somewhere at zero. Okay, that's good. Right, but you could just leave the IP alone in that case. Uh, no, because the IP is already being moved by the kernel. You need to put it back somewhere. The kernel doesn't understand that it might have multiple operations inside of one. I, ideally, region two to three wouldn't be part of the block the kernel knew about. Right. But you can't do that because we only want to register one range of IPs. I mean, that, <laughs> that, that, there's a trade-off here. There's a trade-off here. You could, if you made these all separate regions, then you're correct. You wouldn't want, you can put the ret at the region boundary and this is never an issue. But you don't actually want to do that. Because that would require like an RB lookup in kernel at every, at every uh, the, the, schedule. Yeah. The reason you want to do it this way is the case where you are interrupted is actually unlikely, right? right? So what the kernel, if you, if you have only one region, then the kernel check for whether you're within that region is really cheap. Yeah. Okay, so you do an initial check or you're in the whole mess. Yes. yes. 
and then we just tell the user yeah. space, so fix it up. The kernel, the kernel check is strictly, are you in the whole mess? And if you're in the whole mess, it moves you to the restart handler. And the restart handler knows about every subregion in the whole mess, but the restart handler is entirely in user space. So the kernel logic can continue to be re, you know, one branch as to whether you're in the region or not. We don't and want to set up like an arbitrary mapping of should you restart somewhere. That would be way harder. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. 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 And, and then there's some intelligence in these macros in that um, what these actually expand to will go, am I between three and zero before I even start doing the subcases? And if I'm not, it'll just skip to the next. And there's not that much assembly, so we just have a, a very simple jump table. That, that's entirely how you set up in user space. Uh, sorry. I'm sort of wondering whether or not you can simplify this uh, not um, kind of dramatically by making by making specific rules as uh, regarding the, the uh, uh, pattern of data in this in in this buffer. Uh, for example, uh, you uh, for example you could say that well um, uh, you get rid of the entire the, the entire region. Uh, Two, three. There, if if you say, well, if I if I am at a return, then I know that I already did whatever I was going to do, and just ignore it. I suppose you could do that, but you'd have to like inspect the research handler. It turns out to be simpler just not to bother. Well, it's. It's and there are cases where you've committed, but you still have to do other things. Like you know, change a return value or something like that. So not every committed case is just a return. It it was more of a, are there things like that that could make things dramatically, that that, that would uh, things. It's worth thinking about. I it's worth thinking about, but nothing has come up like that that we thought was worth doing. Sorry. Once you've committed, what difference does it make if you get preempted? Uh, the kernel is not that, right? Because you don't want to make the kernel aware of every commit. Because that would require the kernel. If, if the kernel doesn't know you've committed or not. No, no, no. The kernel's aware of two addresses, and that's it. The kernel's, and the issue is that there are many places inside there that are you know, safe, but the kernel can't know that unless we have an arbitrary map. So there's another block after this one. There's many, there's many such little primitives like this in that, in that one kernel block. So, so consider that this, for example, this piece of assembly is implementing a PostCPU spin lock. And in the previous example, we gave a PostCPU linked list. Right? If you only had a single region, you'd only be able to make one of those primitives available at a time. If the kernel had to check for every single different region, that would be slow. You can, you can combine those by putting every primitive in one big region and having user space figure out whether it's at the commit in the slow path. Right? Correct, correct. But this example is pulled from a larger set of operations, right? We d you, you could definitely write it, so it wouldn't be a, I would argue that you could write this example with one region, but it would be unrealistic because you would never write it, you'd never write it with one region because there's almost always more than one operation you want. It turns out like, so what we actually provide user space at Google is we have a set of operations we provide them. We have these spin locks, we have these lists, we have compare and, compare and swap, we have double compare and swap, which is compare and swap with a second swap value. Which second turns, compare value. Sec, that's what I said, so I meant, sorry. With a second compare value. And they actually build their more complicated things out of these basic primitives. And this has two examples. One is it actually keeps your critical sections for the transactions really short, which reduces the chance of uh, being unable to make progress because you're being delivered preemptions or signals at a too faster rate. Uh, and two is it just makes for much simpler code because you can use these with high level structures and operations and code, right? Because that previous example was assembly. And we have to be quite careful. We have to be quite careful in the actual restartable sequence because we need to be able to make sure we can address it properly and it's not gonna do anything funny with the language runtime and everything else. Um, so yeah, the, 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 there's a number of exam or advantages to, to laying it out in that fashion. The end result of this is that all of these operations are absurdly fast. Um, you can do all of these, you know, spin locks that cost two nanoseconds for per, per CPU spin locks that cost two nanoseconds. Um, and the, the comp exchange and double comp are probably the most expensive, and even those are just a couple nanoseconds. 
And the one other thing that helps them be fast, I should mention, that I mean, is clear from the assembly you just saw, the user space doesn't ever have to branch or check or do anything to know whether or not the, the, the transaction was successful. And this turns out to be important, is that if the transaction was successful, user space you know, barely even knows they were operating under RSEC. It's only that they get automatically aborted without ever having to do anything about it if well, anything happens. We, we've moved all the overhead to the slow path. Like, so a, a motivating example is a big part of the reason we were doing this was malloc. Um, because our malloc caches per thread, and we were having problems both from, we had tens of thousands of threads, and that was too much fragmentation, and also just we had those problems where one thread was allocating, another thread was threading, and there was no natural path to the memory between those threads. So this was both, I mean, this, this set the foundation for an interesting challenge in that we'd done this per thread malloc, because a lot of our data structures at Google are very hypey on malloc, so they depend on this very fast path malloc. And it has a, allocation time of about 50 nanoseconds in the fast path because it's using a per thread list and it can use no 15. atomics. I said 50, 15. I said 15. No. Um, so one, five one, five. one five. 15. Uh, because it's doing non-atomic operations on a linked list that's local to the CPU. Uh, and so we couldn't you know, put atomics or anything else in there because that would immediately raise them. <laughs> that was more than we had budget for. Um, and so we now have it using, instead of using per thread, we have it installed using per CPU. And it's only increased the net cost by something like a nanosecond or two. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, I don't think I follow. So if I need to work, I'm working on a data structure that might be going down, and I have you know, some set of primitives I need to do, carrying sort of a lock at the top level, and then going down into another one, and then going down to another one. Is there any case like where that would be that you need a longer reason? Add in some reason? Well, I'll get a few marks about one reason. Yeah. Okay. But I don't think you want to decide how long you're going to hold it up. Yeah. You, you can take many locks using this, but you're always going to call into the same IP to do it. When um, you have a nested structure like that, you end up wanting to do a more RCU-like thing where you say, I'm going to have a top-level pointer which has lots of information under it, and I'm going to swap out that top-level pointer atomically. And then you see either the old state or the new state. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, that, that's one of Yeah, the one. So it's the next slide, I think, to the disadvantages. Sweet. Um, that way, there's another side there. No. All right. Uh, difference, right? You can't do uh, this. Like, this gives you transactions that will never collide. Okay. No, no, no. This, so this guarantees you'll only operate on one CPU's cache lines ever. Right, you, can, you can't do that with a regular transaction. I'm also not clear how uh, efficient a trivial transaction actually is in practice. I haven't actually used these things. But like, if I wanted to. I think there are mistake use cases because if you have a really tiny transaction for about one pointer, then you have just three other points. Yeah. I mean, the hard transaction is that this is kind of slower, but it's a little bit slower than the lock. And if you do it like, you know, 100 seconds. Yeah. And this is, this is faster than even the lock. Yep, we can't afford to lock. Uh, it, it's also. I, I think the two can actually be complementary because one of the problems we have with TSX is if you want to export data from the transaction, that data better not collide. And this gives you a way of guaranteeing you can export data in a way that won't collide with other cache lines. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the one other still being alightable. Yeah. So one other feature that we've added to this is. No, no, I'm saying it's a separate. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, right. So the one other feature we've added to this is that normally you can't touch any other CPU's data with this uh, when, when, you, when you're op operating in this paradigm for fairly obvious reasons. Racy, non-atomic updates don't mix. Um, 
So yeah, this breaks any ability to do things like reclamation. So going back to the malloc example, if we've got a cache on every CPU, one thing we'd like to do is say, huh, you know, CPU4 you know, has too many resources, maybe we want to steal some, or maybe just CPU4 isn't being used very often, we should eliminate the cache there. So possible that whatever the control software around you has said, you can't run on CPU4 anymore. Yeah. All right, it, it may have just, it, or it may, maybe offline, it might, have, might be still online, but not in your affinity mask. It might be idle, you don't want to wake it up. It might be idle, you don't want to wake it up, right. We, Right. Set affinity onto that core is not an acceptable way to take resources back from that core, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, but we want to be able to want to be able to do this. And so the trick is that if we can gate all accesses through a pointer that's read inside a critical section, and we have some primitives that do this, and it's also possible exercise for the reader to do this with double compare and swap, um, then in fact the only thing you have to do is to restart this, that CPU's critical section, if it's currently running one, and get a barrier. And so we added an operation that does this in kernel. Basically, just IPI to any other um, CPU running your uh, MM. Because, and we assume this is not going to be a cross-process API because you. Um, and we make sure we we start a, a, a an, any critical section the same way you would if you took a signal. Yeah, it's yeah. We try to be we try to be efficient in the case of small programs running on large CPUs. It, the the cost of that call is directly proportional yeah. to how many CPUs you're running on. Right? In fact, we we have a we have a user space implementation of this that basically just scan set affinities plus some magic locking with uh, C groups, the CPU set change case, and it, it it works if you really need to do this, but it costs you know ten fifteen milliseconds. Yep. The IPI based one costs you a couple microseconds plus maybe some time spinning. It's, yep. it's much, much better. And so you can basically have, you know, this is exactly the same as we are trying to imply almost as, you know, a synchronized RCU type thing. Because once you've done that fence, you know that you are the last person who cares about the old version of the data. And this basically gets you everything else you need for be able to do cross CPU or clean. So that's all we have for per CPU atomics. Any other questions? Uh, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering whether this. <laughs> I'm wondering whether this fence operation could be added to something like what I proposed two years ago, sysmen barrier. So the uh, the idea is it's a system call that iterates on all the the CPUs that are actually running on the, uh, the, uh, the, the VM of the process to send a uh, memory barrier. So that basically, uh, so this you can. This does this. Huh? This does this. Fence does this. Yeah, our, our fence also happens to have a memory barrier yeah, there so for it's, the same reason. It's pretty yeah. similar, but I guess you guys are restarting some, some, some regions. Just I mean, nice that you interrupt and restarts it, if I understand correctly. Um, well, the IPI, by its existence, doesn't actually force a restart because we don't care if an important, an important point to point is thing to point out is that taking an interrupt on the CPU does not actually restart the sequence, and this turns out to be important because uh, other because if you do like pprof on these binaries, <laughs> you start to take a signal inside these sections and it just blows up. Perf works. Which is nice, but yeah. So interrupts don't actually okay. interrupt. Uh, don't actually restart a critical section. Do a as well. Not that either. No. Um, what we, what we do we, all, all the IPI has to do is when it lands on the other CPU, check am I in fact still running, and if I am in fact still running, the fact that the interrupt's been delivered means you can go look at where it's running in user space and potentially deliver a restart. And you don't even have to do like a reschedule, you just have to change the IP. Yeah. It's really so, trivial. So uh, I guess my part of Matthew's question is it possible to make this so that it does both the sysmen barrier and does this? It does a sysmen barrier yeah, in the current you, implementation. You could, you could combine them. Oh, I would, you, you could definitely like extend it to include both semantics. It could be guaranteed. It, it does be, a memory barrier already in the current I, I know. I'm okay. saying you could, you could use this. To, Matthew's uh, asking uh, about a separate guarantee. Oh, I, oh, you can give it an option. Yeah, you, you could totally do that. Okay. It's, 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 it's an option. Um, 
I have some reservations about such sort of barriers just because of what they do to your ability to validate such a program and also there's just it, it, it's it, tricky to get that right even if even if you have the kernel support for it it's tricky to get the user semantics right but that's I mean, that, let's not go off into the memory barrier. We looked in this into talk. some. There's, there's time for that elsewhere. We spent some time thinking about what you could do with just the guarantee of the memory barrier, and it turns out to be really hard to be. You know, it sounds really useful. I'm not 100% clear how to write an algorithm that makes that takes advantage of it. Not that they don't exist. Oh. We can discuss that. Sure, I'd love to hear about it. But it's certainly a great idea and it's something we something we have but that yeah that 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 could be totally opted into this into this um, yeah other people have questions yeah it's a bit of a mess right now um, but as I recall I think we proposed this various places upstream a couple years ago I thought we talked about it we started talking about it, but then we got really busy with something else. Yeah. And life moved on. Now we have a you know entirely useful example because when we were first looking at it, we didn't actually know if this would work, and then eventually we built it into Malloc, and now it's used all over. The most useful point is we just finished another. So periodically at Google, we rebase to a newer upstream kernel, and so we've just finished a recent round of that. So we've kind of just gone through all these patches again and started moving them up to the current kernel, or have moved them up to. A, a more recent kernel, so it's kind of a reasonable time for us to talk about cleaning up and pushing them out properly so they don't have to do it next time around. Um, it's also worth noting that we extended it to support some other architectures like PowerPC and have kind of verified that everything yeah, we have a power as you'd expect as well. it works as you'd it, it works as you'd expect there, but having it work on more one than x86 is kind of nice from an initial version point of view. Um, anyone else? Is that all right. Uh, I think we also were asked to talk a little bit about. I mean, I, if, if people want to talk. I don't know if people were here for the user scheduling stuff yesterday. It's perhaps How many people saw the user scheduling talk? Um, if, if you weren't here for the talk, it's going to be hard to have questions. But if people have questions, I'm happy to go through them. If people want me to go through the slides again, I, I suppose time depending, I'm happy to do that too. Anyone have anything better? I think this officially ended at six, which is now. Okay, there we go. I, I don't know. Uh, this is